Well, good morning, everyone. I have the uh, pleasure and privilege of introducing a speaker this morning who is not a guest, uh, but he is speaking, preaching for the first time in our church, certainly not for the first time in his life, but for the first time in our church. Uh, many of you know Ricky Ramos. He has been a founding member of this church. He leads one of our small groups. He has the unenviable burden of being my father-in-law. Uh, God bless him and keep him. And I approached him and asked, would he be willing to preach to us? Uh, he was um, willing only because he is extremely humble. His preference is to sit and listen, but he actually has much to bring to us. Um, Ricky was a pastor for over 20 years, if my calculations are right, in our family of churches, both in El Paso and in Juarez, Mexico. He is a dearly beloved member, former member of the church in Juarez, Mexico, was there just last week. Uh, and we really have the benefit of benefiting from him on a weekly basis, those of us that know him, those of you that are in his small group, in his wisdom, in his character, in his love. And in a particular way, what I wanted to highlight this morning was his steadfast faithfulness in following the Lord. I, I told Ricky that one of the reasons I, I wanted to have them speak to us is there's just something about hearing from someone uh, who is not some young dude up there sharing what he thinks from the Bible, which is frankly me and Aaron most of the time. Uh, it's nice to hear someone who has been following the Lord for decade after decade, has established a history of faithfulness towards God, of knowledge in the Word, and frankly, those of us that know Ricky just know that it's true. When he speaks, the people in our church lean in to listen. And I wanted that to be the case on a Sunday morning, so I pray you will lean in to listen as we benefit from him this morning. So let's welcome him as he comes to preach to us. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Am I on? Can you hear me? Well, good morning, church. Uh, John never minds my instructions. Uh, he. Uh, told him to make it short, and uh, he never does that. So thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and share with you. So let's just uh, lead into it. And if you can turn to the book of Ephesians, um, chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. It reads... Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, just been singing about you. We've been singing, Lord, about how you are beautiful, how you are powerful, how you are wonderful, and how you have come into our darkness, Lord, to bring your light, to illuminate our minds, our hearts, Lord, to be able to respond to your invitation for salvation, Lord, for forgiveness, for a hope of a new life, We thank you for that, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and help me, Lord, and help the church, Lord, to draw from this passage what it means, Lord, to have received all these gifts from you, to know you and to know your forgiveness, to understand the cross, Lord, to have this hope that it will have an impact in the way that we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were coming into a mall, and there was a plaque there that caught my attention, and I got it by, with the corner of my eye, and it said, uh, the title was, it, was it, you know, Code of Conduct. It's a code of conduct as you step into that mall. 
So I didn't go over and uh, to read the, the content of that uh, plague, but just the fact that it was there, you know, uh, kind of harnessed me or galvanized me, is that a word? As I was going into that mall, I was more aware, maybe at one degree more, that there was an expectation upon me as a patron of that mall to behave in a certain way because I was going to receive the benefits of what that mall provides. So out of curiosity, I googled the definition of a code of conduct, and I'm not preaching a code of conduct here, but bear with me. It says that, uh, and this is probably one definition out of many, but um, <clears throat> this is the one that I have found. And it says a code of conduct is a set of established principles and expectations that are considered binding or obligatory to any person who is a member of a particular group. Examples of a code of conduct are, for instance, the Geneva Convention that uh, tells soldiers how to conduct themselves in war, the rules of engagement, if I may. There's also the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, which they are bind by then, but also defines their profession. There's also codes of the United States Fighting Forces. There's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a code in a, that God gave us you know, to reflect his people, that we, that the people of God belong to God. But he just didn't give him a code, and we'll get into that. He took that code, how he spelled it out, and then with the intention to, for those people to take that code and put it in their hearts. Not just know it in their minds and just have an outward behavior complying to that code, but to be transformed by that code in the inner being. So that, you know, even he says later that God will write that code into their hearts. He will write his law into our hearts because he wants that to be part of us. That instruction. He brought to mind uh, a long time ago, I was in a flight and uh, I was sitting there, and there was an incident. I, don't, I tried to remember what it was. An incident between um, somebody in the plane and the flight attendant, the, uh, the stewardess. And there was an altercation of some sort. And then there was this young man that came up and intervened in, in the situation and just addressed the whole thing in such a way that it just caught my attention. He was just so proper, so courteous, so uh, uh, gentlemanly, gentleman-like, that, you know, he kind of diffused the situation, and I just felt compelled after, you know, we were actually deep planning um, to just approach this young man and say, you know, I just have to tell you, it was just amazing how you conducted yourself in that situation. And he just respectfully said, sir, well, I'm a Marine. Oh, okay. So that just stuck with me. He says, he's a Marine. So being a Marine means that you behave in this way. You know, it, it shows what you are. It shows that they belong to a group that has this particular way of living in life or code of conduct or whatever, a statement of mission or whatever you want to call it. But he didn't just have an outward code that was upon him, he seemed to be embracing that and be identified and it actually being described by that code. In this paragraph, Paul is resuming what F.F. F. Bruce calls a paranoidic paragraph. This par paranoidic paragraph, it means that this is our, he's urging things upon us. He's telling us things that he wants us to know as to how to live our life, in a sense. It's an address or a communication strongly urging someone to do something, or rather, as I was saying, to be something. And he did this before. In Ephesians 14, he, he urged the believers to not walk any longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. In Ephesians 5.2, he says, he admonished us to walk in love as imitators of God. In Ephesians 5.8, he urges us to walk as children of light. In essence, to live by values that are opposed to those of the surrounding society. And now he's urging us to 
be wise. And it seems like this is a, um, a summary of all that has come beforehand. To walk, which has already been used to spell out the ethical implications of the eternal plan of God. In other words, he's giving us a summary, a code of, a code of conduct of sorts, a behavior, a statement that not only spells out the principles and expectations for a Christian, but also that describes who they are, who lays, that lays out a way of living, a lifestyle that further explains what it means to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. To put it in a succinct way, or trying to put it in a succinct way, it's, it's, it's a call not to mere external conduct, but a behavior that flows from the new person God has made us to be, and the community we now belong to. A state of being that is to be reflected in a new ethic of life. In short, and this is probably the way that I would uh, summarize th this whole thing, is in short, a new life and a new ethic. You know, a new life brings forth a new ethic of living. And it is what Paul is kind of encapsulating here as he has given us all these paramedic exhorted, exhortative urgings, you know, to walk in such manners. He now is, seems to be coming to the last one, and he says then, look carefully then how you walk. It reminds me of a title of a book from, by Charles Colson that says, How Then Shall We Live? This is telling us how then shall we live. So let's begin. First, it says carefully. Look carefully of how you walk. Therefore, therefore, look how carefully how you are walking. Paul admonishes his readers to take great care in the conduct of their Christian lives. I'm quoting uh, Peter O'Brien. This is not on your screen. It signifies that if something is done accurately, precisely, after close attention has been given. And together with the imperative to watch, it indicates the, that the admonition regarding godly behavior is both important and urgent. So being careful in how we walk, it's important and it's urgent. The new life we received is precious, is fragile, and imitating God and keeping clear of danger is not automatic. It requires careful attention. It requires vigilance over our lives. It echoes other calls in Scripture to watchfulness, to be alert, to be ready. It underscores the fact that the Christian life and walk are not to be taken for granted. Yes, of course, as believers, we have been assured that before the foundation of the world that we were chosen in Christ to be holy and blameless in his sight, that has already been done. That we have been adopted as children of God through Christ who sacrificed and shed blood. We have redemption and forgiveness of our sins through that. And that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Yet in another place, the Apostle Peter admonishes us to keep sober in spirit, to not to conform to the former lusts which, we, which were our own in our ignorance, but to be sober, to be of sober spirit, to be on the, on the alert for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Watch, watchfulness then, it's necessary. You wouldn't go into the jungle you know, looking for a lion. I know these guys, that are, many of you guys are here hunters and stuff, but you wouldn't go to hunt a lion and be careless. You wouldn't walk into a jungle that you know that has wild animals and just walk around like if it was a walk in the park. You would be watchful. You would be alert to any little indication that there was something that was upon you. So watchfulness is an important part of that ethic of this new way of living, not to be careless 
with our lives, but to treasure what we have been given. We have been given a precious treasure that needs to be guarded. Those who have received the gift of new life, having been renewed by God's Spirit, filled with God's love, awakened to the knowledge of God, are to, be, are to carefully live lives before God in wisdom, giving testimony to His power, love, and the riches of His grace, which should be the great overreaching aspiration of our lives that informs every step, every step, I'm sorry, that we take in our lives. So, being careful. Watch carefully how you live. Secondly, by being wise. Obviously, this, this includes a general call to wisdom. Proverbs 4, 5 says, get wisdom. Like, get wisdom. It's something that you need to go after. Get wisdom. Get insight. Proverbs 3, 13, 14 says, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy. Pastor Jack Wellman, I found this uh, quote. He says, Wisdom begins and ends with the fear of the Lord. It isn't fear of being struck by lightning or fear of being struck dead, but it's a deep, abiding, holy reverence and respect for the Lord and for His Word, the Bible. Wisdom begins with reverence for God and fear for Him and His Word. That's where wisdom begins. Where there is no fear of the Lord, there can never be any true wisdom. It is just not possible. We have to acknowledge God as God and position ourselves correctly. God is God and we are not. He has always been and we have not always been. He is eternal. We are not. We have seen all those, uh, you know, we discuss and we have heard of all these attributes of God, even the incommunicable attributes of God. Now, he's other. He's transcendent. He's above everything. And we need to be grasped by who God is. We have to be captivated. We have to be affected by the reality of God, of who God is, so that we might approach wisdom and get wisdom. If we don't have that, then it will be very difficult even to understand the gospel, which is a specific wisdom that Paul is addressing here. He says that there's a special wisdom in understanding the gospel here. There's a quote by Peter O'Brien that says, It's God's intention that believers should understand his saving plan. He therefore lavished his grace upon us in all wisdom and insight by making known to us the divine mystery, which is his purpose to sum up all things in Christ. Therefore, to understand the mystery, this mystery is to be wise. And understanding this mystery commits believers to bring their life into conformity with God's wonderful plan of saving man and woman in Christ. Paul, in his letter to in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come pro proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech, of wisdom. That means I didn't come to you trying to impress you with human wisdom, with human oratory or rhetoric. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is essentially the revelation of the mystery of God that God in His Son came to die for sinners like you and I. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom, hidden in God, but that has been displayed in this time, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And listen, none of the rulers of this age understood this wisdom, this mystery. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Such is God's wisdom that if he, if the devil himself would have known what God, what, uh, God, what God was up to, he would not have been part of it. 
what is it then, this wisdom? Namely that in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That is what we need to understand. That is the wisdom they need to embrace in order to walk wisely. The fear of God. Understanding who God is and who we are in relation to him. And also understanding the gospel and what has God has done specifically to save us in coming in the person of his son to die on the cross and shed his blood to cleanse us from our sin. A gentleman called Harold Horner, this is not on the screen, he says, the best wisdom is the wisdom given by God for insight into the true nature of God's plan. That is what's going to give us the wisdom. That, is what's, that wisdom is the one that is going to carry us the distance. If we have that in our hearts, then there's something in us that will cause us, even as we, when we walk and stumble and make mistakes, there is this presence of this wisdom, this understanding that will carry you through everything. Mistakes, sins, faults, you know, it will carry you the distance. You will, God will lift you up. God will bring you up again because that he has his wisdom residing in you. Wisdom is taking that insight and rightly applying it to our hearts. Mere knowledge is not enough. It has to be desired. This wisdom has to be desired. It has to be embraced. It has to be precious. It has to be valuable for us. It's something that we need to dwell upon. It's something that we need, to, that when we think about what, who God is and what he did for us, that is a sweet thought for us. It's something that moves our hearts. It's something that affects our emotions. And even as Rob was saying, it moves our will in the right direction. So that we can praise God even when we do not feel like praising God. So this wisdom compels us to please the Lord. It compels us to please the Lord. To please the Lord. That is an ethic. To live a life pleasing the Lord because you have this understanding in you of God and his plan. compels us to please the Lord and also to keep us from falling back into our former patterns of thinking and behavior. If we do fall, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is part of the wisdom. The wisdom, it doesn't call us to perfection or sinlessness because God knows that it's impossible for us. So he made provision in his wisdom that even if we fall knowing his wisdom, we can be restored. No matter how deep and how serious the fall has been, how difficult, how painful has been, God will Restore. He has the power. Jesus, when he says, I, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all our righteousness because he has the authority to do so and do it completely and absolutely. So the wise person looks at his life or her life to see if it's in line with God's saving plan. How he saved us through the cross and made us holy and blameless in him, not counting our trespasses against us. Matthew Henry, in his commentary says, and this is in the screen, this is not as fools, because there's a contrast here. You know, do not be unwise, but be wise. So there's a contrast between the wise and the fool. He says, not as fools who walk to at all adventures, and who have no understanding of their duty, know the worth 
of their souls and through neglect, indolence, and want of care fall into sin and destroy themselves. But the wise, as persons taught by God and endued with wisdom from above, circumspect walking then is the effect of true wisdom. Careful living is the result of true wisdom. Not as fools who walk into all sorts of adventures mindlessly without thinking about the consequences that it's going to bring. God wants us to not live foolishly. Be careful. Look carefully how you walk. Be wise, not foolish. As a church, he says, Peter O'Brien says, the way of wisdom that members of the covenant community are to walk requires insight and understanding into God's will. And that's individually as well as, where, as, well as corporately. And I'm th very thankful, very thankful for John and Aaron and Bart, you know, mainly. I mean, I see these young men and I see a measure of wisdom that is beyond me. Oh, I sit at their feet, you know, learning this wisdom so that as a church, as a community, we have this insight and understanding of God's will. That we are informed regularly, we are fed regularly this diet that is nurturing us with this deposit in us that is there, even though you don't even know it. You are being spoon-fed like I am feeding my little baby girl, uh, my granddaughter, which I was trying to give her some beans and she would just taste the tip of it and then she would spit it because she didn't want it. And then I gave her a piece of avocado and that, you know, she tasted it and then she took that. We, we are to take the avocado. You know, when we are hearing this food that is being um, brought to us, as a community, we are to uh, receive it because it gives that insight and that understanding to God's will that is required. Required not simple intellectual knowledge, though it is included, but also a skill in, in living an, ethic, an ethical walk, a perception and understanding that works itself out in practice. To use my analogy imperfectly, you know, to know how to practically live in the, you know, walk in the mall once you're in it. And if you're a Marine, know how to conduct yourself in a situation that requires, you know, for you to act as, you, as who you are. And for us as Christians then to react and respond to situations as who we are then as well. How to walk in those situations that we walk into regularly in our lives, in our daily walk. So, get wisdom. The fear of God, the understanding of His plan, informing you, making you wise. Another component of this is by making the most of our time. Again, helped by Mr. Horner, Harold Horner, he says, of taking the opportunities offered by time to take advantage of every chance. To do what? To please God. To act in a way that is pleasing to God. That we know that is in conformity with who He is and what He has given us in His salvation. Making the most of our time, for sure, must involve managing of it more efficiently. But making the most of our time here appears to be more about snapping up every opportunity that comes to do what's important. It's not just about efficiency. It's about importance and about taking the opportunity when it comes. And that is... I mean, there's millions of opportunities even represented in this small group of people. My opportunities are not your opportunities. And they may be public or they can be very private. 
But the opportunities are there for you to choose to please God or not please God in how you respond to something or how you respond to yourself when you are tempted with sin. And when you're alone and nobody's watching, you have a choice to make. Are you going to please God in that moment? When we're in front of the TV, when we're surfing the net, when we're watching the news, and there's this, you can click on an article and something that could tempt you could pop up and you choose not to click that icon. There's millions of choices. Some of them, and I will mention that later, some of them significant, some of them, of them are insignificant, but in all of them, we are to be informed by this wisdom, this new ethic that God calls us to. The passage of Mary and Martha, you know, just kind of illustrates this, where Martha, you know, when Jesus came into the house, you know, Martha became busy and just, you know, consumed with getting things ready, which is fine. But Jesus pointed to that Mary was doing the most important thing. In that moment, in that particular situation, Jesus said, this is what's most important. So we also need to know what is most important in a given moment. Should we wash the dishes or should we sit with, sit with God? Should we get busy with something or should we talk to our spouse? Should we just be a couch potato or, you know, uh, talk to our children? I don't know. There's so many things. I'm just using what comes to my mind. But there's so many things that we need to choose in that moment. What is what needs to be snapped up? What is the important thing that God is calling us? We can very easily busy ourselves with anything but what's important. I don't know if you have seen this commercial of an insurance company where this couple has to, or is they're thinking about, you know, looking into their retirement plan, and, and they just, it's just, a, it's just a hyperbole in that, um, it's just very funny how the guy, you know, goes up out into the, to the yard and shakes up the tree in order to drop leaves so that he can occupy, occupy himself by raking leaves. Or the ladies just, you know, doing this to a rug, you know, creating dust so that she can clean it in order to avoid sitting down and planning for their retirement. They are avoiding the important and getting, busying themselves with things that are not consequential. Or even creating situations to make themselves busy so that they can avoid what is important. One thing that can frame our perspective and use our time is the brevity of life. We have only one. I don't know if you know that. I'm getting and being more aware of it all the time. Now, I'm not going to have a replacement. There's no backup here. <laughs> There's only one life, and we should, use, we, should use, we should try to use our time in it to live in a, matter, in a manner that pleases God. James says, you are mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Donald Whitney, Donald Whitney says, time is very much like the sands, the sands in an hourglass. What's left is continuously slipping away. And not only is time short in passing, but we do not even know how short it is know how long before it all passes away. The wise man then uses his time informed by this perspective. It will cause us to be more careful and more intentional with the use of our time. And, I, and again, I, uh, I think I needed to make this clarification at the very beginning. I, I believe that I am preaching to the choir. And in preaching these things, please don't get the wrong impression that I am good at this stuff. Even though just John said something about me in the beginning. You know, we all need to be, again, you know, be harnessed, be galvanized by what the Word brings to us. And be, and respond to it. The years of our life are 70. 
or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom, a heart that will value what's truly valuable and enduring because it sees through the lenses of eternity. The wise know that God has made them, that they, look, that they belong to God by virtue of creation and are his children by virtue of redemption. And they use their time accordingly. accordingly. Their time is taken up with God. Their hearts desire what they seek in the deep recesses of their being is to make the most of their time by living in accordance with God, with accordance with who God is and what he has done to save us to the praise of his glorious grace. Again, the fool, on the other hand, is without hope and without God in the world. He tends to be ungrateful and covetous. For whatever he accomplishes and acquires, he, con he congratulates himself. That is not making a wise use of the time. His life, his body, his heart and mind are, are all taken up with himself. His heart's desire, what he seeks in the deep recesses of his being, is to live for himself in accordance, in accordance with who he has made himself to be, to the praise of himself, walks as, he, as we were before the grace of God. Remember that. He walks as we were. We were fools before the grace of God. In the futile thinking and with our understanding darkened. So making the, ma the most of our time, it was that other component that because the days are evil, being evil, being understood, simply as that which is contrary to God. We live in a world that is contrary to God, to his design and intention for mankind. It has always been this way in every era. I think the only the distinctive of our era is that we have tech, technology in a sense that it's increasing. It has begun in the 80s or 90s when computers began to explode and now it has accelerated exponentially when I was in college, I was taught programming by using cards, you know, punching cards. You remember those? I mean, some of you do. Some of you other young men, young, don't even know what that is. You know, big IBM machines, you know, put all these cards in, you know, a program like this. Probably what used the memory and the capacity just to make a phone call in my iPhone right now, you know. But, that, but the, it has always been this way. We, will, we live in a world that is contrary to God. It has always been this way, but it's all, all, all more dangerous today because that is enhanced, you know, it's heightened by the availability of information and, uh, you know, in just how it goes out. And it's everywhere. The world we live in we live in, Donald, Whit Donald Whitney says again, it's difficult to live. To, uh, in, the wor in the world we live in, it's difficult to use time wisely because it heightens with technology and all these enablements the natural course of our minds, our bodies, and the world that leads us towards evil. And not being as bad as we can be, but just pushes us to be to forget God, to be against God, to neglect God, and in the worst case, to be contrary to God. That is a tendency, that is a current, that is the flow that we are facing. So be, why make the most use of the time? Because the days are evil. There's this tendency in our days and in our world to alienate us, to separate us, to keep us away from God in the way we live. Evil also because it's controlled by the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air, the enemy that opposes everything about God and the, and the advance of his purpose. 
sis and kingdom. Mr. Hohner has says, we're not to let him intimidate us. We're neither also to avoid the evil days or fear them, but rather, this is the alternative, this is where the ethic presses in, but rather live wisely, taking advantage of every opportunity in this immoral environment to live a life that pleases God. So in evil days, we are pressed, you know, and pushed to live in this immoral environment, this evil environment that resists God to live by taking every advantage and please God. So, following that, you know, making the most of our time because the days are evil, then do not become foolish. Do not become foolish. That means that we can become foolish. And he's speaking to Ephesians. He's speaking to the saints. He's speaking to those who have been chosen by God and been sealed by the Holy Spirit. He says, do not become foolish. So Christians, you know, can become foolish. I can become foolish in a given moment. And if I haven't been foolish for a while, I, there's certainly the possibility I can be foolish even today. Do not enter into the condition of foolishness, says Mr. Horner. Do not be enticed by the God of this age to become foolish. To become as those who do not know God. You do know God. Don't you? You do know God. God has come. Through the gospel, when you believe, when you repented, when you trusted Jesus, he promised that he would come to your life. So you do know God. So he says here, do not become as those that do not know God, because you know God. Who, who don't desire in their lives God and have no insight or appreciation into God's plan, do not live as if you don't know these things. Live as if you know them and possess them, and your life and your moments and your decisions are informed by that. So do not become foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understanding involves the mind and the will, again. It is knowledge that causes action. It will not happen by osmosis. You will not live an eth ethical life without applying your will to it. It's not like Jesus is going to come and just do it for you in a sense. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic here. That is the biblical reality. Jesus, obviously, he is the one that will finish the work he has begun in us. And that is a foundational prim promise that we have. It doesn't depend finally on us what we are and are to become and the hope that we have. But on the other side of the coin, the Bible clearly presents that we are to apply ourselves and our will to what we have received and to what we have known. There's two sides of the coin. And both of them are true. They are parallel truths. And they don't exclude each other or are contradictory to each other. That involves our will. It, in, it involves our minds. And it involves those producing actions. An intelligent grasp of knowledge, says Mr. Horner, that has resulting consequences. Indeed, F.F. F. Bruce comments on verse 17 and says that it's incumbent, it's incumbent upon the people of Christ to know and do his will. It's incumbent upon us to know and do his will. And that doing his will is not a matter of irrational impulse. It's just, okay, I'm just going to do it without knowing what even it is. But of intelligent reflection and action. This whole issue of understanding, this whole thing of thinking in our minds reflectively. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks, for as a man thinks within himself, so is he. What a man thinks of himself, 
within himself, so is he. And so he acts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow, flow the springs of life. It has been said, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle. Sow a lifestyle, reap a destiny. We are urged here to know what God would have us do, both generally, there's a general will of God where he says, you know, you are to be Christ-like, and that applies equally to all, all of us. But there's also the particular will where he says, you know, you are to, as you pray, as you pray and seek counsel and, and seek uh, wisdom, you know, what college are you to go to, who you are to marry, when, and so forth. Those are, th that's seeking the particular will of God for your life. That is not in Scripture. In Scripture, it gives you the general principles to find that particular will. But you need to know the general will of God, and you need to know, and you need to seek for the particular will of God in your own circumstance. Every moment of every day, we are constantly making decisions. Some are more consequential than others, but all in some way or another have an impact in the direction of our lives. So every little decision, it's, it's, it's steering you one way or another. I mean, we, we never navigate straight line. You know, we're always like, because of our imperfection and sinfulness and, you know, all that, that, you know, but, you know, you want, to st you want to have those actions be such that in the cumulative of them, you know, they point you in the right direction. It's a definition of a line. I googled it also. A row of closely spaced dots will look like a continuous line. That's a definition of a line, a lot of dots. A life it's a lot of dots. It's a lot of moments. Our life is made of all the connecting dots, the decisions that we make. And of course, nobody can have a perfect ascending line, but we are all to be careful that it's pointing in the right direction. Um, Ricky Alcantar, when we went to the ordination of Alex and Shondo. He gave Alex a word and basically it said, you know, Alex, when you for, were first called, you didn't know. Coming into this place that you are right now, all the twists and turns that it will take you to come here, you didn't anticipate all those things. And then he said, from this point, for, point forward, you don't know either what twists and turns you will find. But let that, but let the direction of your life be directed for, for, with where you're going. Knowing where you're going and who you serve, who you, belong, who you belong to. And I thought it was very good. Again, the goal is not perfection. It is this impossible. But to live a life that is in, in the whole gives witness to the gracious saving work of God in Christ in careful wise decision making choosing to imitate God's character and actions instead of being conformed to the passions of our former way of life this is what we're called, uh, called to one of my favorite movie moments is with the fellowship of the ring where they find themselves in the caves of Moria and those that and have seen the Lord of the Rings. And Frodo says, I wish the ring had never come to me. He's talking about all these things. He had never, had never anticipated that would come to him by having and possessing this ring. I wish none of this had happened. And Gandalf, being the wise, you know, quote unquote, so do all who live to see just times, he says. But that's not for them to decide in terms of the twists and turns. All we have to decide 
and here's the word, we have to decide every moment in every little cave that we find ourselves in, we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And I thought, well, that is wisdom. I mean, in terms of wise living and living wisely means that we live to please God and for His glory, for who He is and what He has done for us. That is the guiding principle. That is the compass. To conclude, I am... Um, Bible says that wisdom is justified by all her children. It means that you see wisdom in people. And I see wisdom here. I was thinking of Stan. He's not here. <laughs> Where is Stan? Uh, and many of you. You know, because he uh, has shared some stuff that he does, and I thought, Stan just very simply applies himself wisely to do things that I would never do. But anyway, but uh, people, uh, wisdom is justified by her children. I, I'm thinking about when I went to Juarez, we learned that Enrique Apodaca, you know, uh, an usher at the church, he struggled with diabetic, diabetes and um, heart trouble. And when we went, we learned that he passed away and I was just thinking about his life, and I think, you know, this man was there all the time that I was in that church. He was there at the front, you know, handing out the bulletins with a smile, welcoming people. And he was investing his time. He was making wise use of his time. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, Enrique, you're probably collecting the dividends now of that wise living, you know. I'm thinking about Mario, Maria Luisa Sagal, another lady that we knew that she lost her husband to kidnapping and murder when we were back there in the, when was it, 2010, around that time. And then she, she chose to trust God even in the midst of that tragedy, painful as it was and disorienting as it was. She chose to seek God and to follow God and to press in with God and to do what she understood to be God's will. And then we met her and she was smiling, you know, and as he, she greet, greeted Lori and I, and her son was beside her. He's just graduated, you know, from college and stuff. And, and she's just there, part of many other people that you say, you know, there's wisdom displayed in their children. And this is what God wants in the church, you know, for for wisdom to be displayed in us individually and collectively. Wisdom is proved to be right by what it does or the behavior of her followers. John Stott says, Christian wisdom is practical wisdom. Our Christian walk or behavior must be worthy of God's call in love and as children of light. No conduct or behavior that seeks to impress, that is not what we're looking for, with an apparent perfect religious behavior outwardly, nor seeks the acceptance or favor which we already have been granted, but one that is indicative of who we are and the community we belong to by a decisive pursuit a biblical wisdom that though not perfect persistently seeks to imitate, please, and glorify God. A wise person is not perfect in what he or she does, but is guided by this profound understanding of God in Christ and is therefore committed to understanding and doing the Lord's will for his life in the context of the church. For him or her, his code of conduct not only spells the principles and expectations that govern his life, it defines him. It describes him. It's who he is. He's that Marine that he acted according to who he was and learned to be and represented both God and the church. Well, well, the Marines in this case. <laughs> 
but he represented the organization that he was part of well. And unbeknown to us, it will distinguish you. It will distinguish me without knowing sometimes that we are reflecting the work and the character of another in our life. So in closing, by way of application, I'm just going to tell you these questions that we could, that maybe will galvanize us into evaluating where we are in our walk. I hope they serve you. What does our general demeanor, what does the general demeanor of our lifestyle communicate? Does it communicate somehow that we know, fear God, and that we understand and treasure His salvation? Does it communicate that we have become His children and belong to His family? And so, we are to ask, are there areas where I'm not being careful to act as who I am in Christ? Are there situations where I'm not being wise as the one who understands the gospel? Am I aware of the evil I face every day and wisely take advantage of every opportunity to please God? Am I guarding my thoughts and reflecting upon the truth and understanding God's will and choosing to obey Him? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for this passage that encapsulates this new ethic that flows out of the new life that you have given us. We pray, Lord, that uh, we may live carefully, wisely, using our time for what's important and doing God's will. Let that lifestyle describe and distinguish us for the glory of God. Amen.